My name is James Duffy. I'm, uh, like you, a member of the National Association of Rocketry. Been around for many years. I am also kind of a closet historian. Uh, up to this point, most of my historical focus has been uh, focused on digging up scale data. And uh, it's taken a bit of a twist um, in recent years. I wanted to share some of that with you. Um, of course, we should all know that the founder of the National Association of Rockets, G. Harry Stein, we all gathered here, not here, but rather in Seattle, around this time last year, for the opening of the, uh, the new NAR exhibit at the Museum of Flight there in Seattle. And that accompanied the accession of the Stein archives to the Museum of Flight. Well, some people don't know this, but there's another Stein archives at the National Air and Space Museum. Harry, back in 1973, effectively cleared out his file cabinets of the less critical items that he had on file. There were a number of things he, there's 12 of these boxes. I don't know if this is gonna show up here. They're basically, each one of these boxes contains roughly the amount of information you put in a standard file drawer. And uh, there's just a wide range of stuff in there. I found everything from personal bills to letters from his publishers. He was a, a, a dramatically prolific writer. Uh, Steve has a couple, I'm gonna be referring to Steve Crystal a number of times during this talk. Um, do you have a couple of his books there? Yeah, this is his... Uh... Harry's first claim to fame was that as a young man, he began writing science fiction, which was published in these pulp science fiction magazines, compilations that were sold for insignificant amounts of money. This was uh, dated 1951. It may have been one of his first that published his first works. First published, first, published. first published work, 25 cents. Is that a name for it? No, no this, this is as Harry Stein. Yeah, originally it was, and then he changed over, and then he actually went back later in his life. So there's a wide range of materials here, not all, all of it directly related to model rocketry. Now, one of the things that's not contained in this archive is what I think are the Dead Sea Scrolls of model rocketry, and that is the, the correspondence between G. Harry Stein and Orville Carlyle. Who here knows who Orville Carlyle is? Do I need to go into great detail about Orville? Okay. The correspondence is fascinating. Um, it's available for everybody to download off of the Quest Aerospace website. The number is about 50 to 55 pages, I believe. And it was ignited when Harry wrote a article for this magazine, Mechanics Illustrated, this is the February 1957 issue of Mechanics Illustrated, that was aimed at individuals who were interested in making their own rocket motors to fly rockets. There was a lot of interest in that, in that at that time. Kids were getting hurt doing that. And that article made it to Orville Carlisle, who was a shoe salesman, he owned a shoe store, in Norfolk, Nebraska, and he was a fireworks enthusiast who had developed at his brother's request a small reusable rocket motor based on fireworks technology. It's an ugly little secret about our hobby guys, based on fireworks. Don't tell anybody outside this room. That could be used for what were effectively outreach events. His brother was interested in promoting aviation, he wanted to add a rocket to his, his spiel, if you would. And he asked his brother, the fireworks enthusiast, to develop that. That project sat for several years after he was successful with it. Uh, he read the article and recognized that Harry might be somebody who could help him get the idea for a reusable hobby rocket motor out to a wider audience and wrote this letter on January 23rd, 1957. Now this basically says, 
I've invented a rocket. Would you like to have one? Do you think this might be something that you would be interested in? Well, enough of us in this room know enough of Harry. Many of us had the opportunity to meet him <coughs> over the years. I did not, unfortunately. That hit him pretty well. And what Harry received in the mail a few days later was this, the Carlisle Rocket Shoot Mark II, which was a simple reusable model that had pressed black powder motors and used a, uh, a pencil sharpener as the nose cone. Now, Steve, I'm going to ask you to stand up and talk about the pencil sharpener nose cone for just a bit here. All right. The company out of uh, Chicago was called Lead Sweetie. They were a, a toy and novelty company. They made stuff like little plastic molds that you could use to make uh, plaster Paris things. They made the fabulous automatic crayon holder, okay, which you need. In addition, they actually got a, uh, a patent for a nose cone sharpener made out of plastic. And this, this is one of them. This is actually a hybrid. The first one was sold by Leeds Sweetie, cost 10 cents and was round, you can see what it looks like up there, it had little stripes. Subsequently, they made another one that was sold by Sterling. And then some of the pictures that you can see on the website, you'll see both of them. But what they did was you just took the uh, bottom part out and you used the top as a nose cone and put a little block in it. So very, very clever and uh, readily available for 10 cents. It's sleeved over the, the body tube, is that correct? No, they actually, if you look at this, you can see that the body tube was roughly the same size, and they used a little wood block in the bottom of it. That, that, became, the shoulder, that became the shoulder and plugged in. So. Okay. Thank you, Steve. No, you're welcome. And one, James, one yep. more thing, if anybody wants to see, you mentioned those motors. Uh, These are the original brown rocket shoots, and I'm not going to pass them around. But afterwards, <laughs> you're welcome to look at them. The brown doesn't refer to the color. No. The brown refers, refers the to the fact that they were made by uh, Brown Manufacturing, is who Orville got to make the first motors. And if you look at the nozzles, you'll see how different these are. And then subsequently, they went to our friend Fernestus and got rocket shoot motors made that had the pressed nozzles in them. And then eventually, they ended up uh, uh, with another kind. You can see that uh, they put out boxes, but afterwards we'll. we'll can I add one detail? What was that? Uh, the rocket ship motors, the very first motors came out, had, uh, okay, the ejection charge had a cap. Mm -hmm. We also had a cap for a nozzle that was going to go for play and drill. So your, your nozzles there are play only. Mm -hmm. So these are a later version. Oh, okay, very interesting. Yeah, I... So the important thing here is that Brown was happy to make the prototype motors for Orville Carlisle. His company lacked the ability to scale the production. We'll get to that in just a, a minute here. Is that Brown a fireworks company? Or? Brown is a fireworks okay. company. Yeah, but the, real, the big significance of the motors themselves is that's how we got the size of the motor. Correct. If you go to a fireworks stand at, at, at New Year's or Fourth of July and buy an assortment of fireworks, they'll be in standard model rocket sizes, roughly. This correspondence continued throughout the rest of the year, and Harry immediately realized the potential here. He saw an opportunity to create a company. He saw the opportunity to get this out to kids and save lives, and he also saw the opportunity to develop an organization around that. The first element of that was the company, and he created a company called Model Missiles Incorporated. This is a, uh, a photograph of a pristine Model Missiles Incorporated uh, promotional document, piece of collateral that was in the archives there at Air and Space. And uh, I find it interesting, they sold this uh, this metal tower here. This is one of Steve's holy grails that he hasn't found yet. Right. Uh, there are a couple examples of these metal towers at the Museum of F Flight that you can go see. If and, that, and that's the one thing, I've been in the hobby forever, and I, when I went to Bill Stein's place in Phoenix, and I saw the tower in the corner inside the box it came in. I never knew for all these years that Model Missile sold the tower. I thought I knew everything, but I didn't know that. But they did sell the towers. The problem with them, the exhaust caused them to rust really quick. And so they never lasted very long. The people that throw them away because they're all rusted up. Hey, I still want one. 
<laughs> That's a three fin rocket coming out of a four fin tower, so no figure. That was a problem from the earliest days of our hobby. <laughs> okay. So this is a letter that Harry sent to, it was a form letter he put together that he sent, circulated, he was living in Denver at this point. He circulated it to people in the Denver area who were in the hobby industry at the time that he was ready to start model missiles, to formally launch the company, at least locally, on a, on a, a smaller basis. And it's just a simple uh, uh, invitation. As part of Denver's hobby industry, you are cordially invited to attend the first ever public demonstration of model rocket-powered missiles ever to take place in the United States. Now, this isn't true because Orville Carlisle had already been this demonstrating for years prior to this, but let's roll with Harry here for a little while. Look at the date. Oh. Man, this is what you call living right, right? <laughs> Two days wow. after Sputnik. The letter itself is dated October 3rd. So was there interest in rockets in America during that week? Perhaps? I think so. <clears throat> Let's fast forward a couple of months. Harry has launched the company, Model Missiles Incorporated. He needs to put some kind of wrapper around this to generate interest and support for this hobby, this brand new hobby. And he decides he's going to create an organization around that. And this is a simple mini graph sheet that was circulated to kids in the Denver area, uh, inviting them to meetings of the Junior Scientist Hobby Club, which met in various places around Denver for various topics. Uh, this uh, December 30th meeting was all about aviation, for instance. Let's look at the January 3rd meeting. G. Harry Stein, a rocket engineer from White Sands, is going to present on rockets. He's going to have film. He's going to have demonstration. How exciting. This meeting will also be the first one of a new organization being formed nationwide with headquarters in Denver. It is the Model Missile Association, which G. Harry Stein is founding. So there's the birth of the National Association of Rocketry right there. Within a year, oh, oh, this is cool. This is Harry's original ink wow. artwork for the Model Missile Association logo that was used for uh, generating camera-ready artwork. Within a year, it became the National Association of Rocketry. And I actually found a document on this. He had a correspondence with a public relations firm there in Denver formed by uh, retired Air Force people where they decided that they encouraged him to pull the, the word missile out because that had connotations and to put the word national into it. So the Model Missile Association becomes the National Association of Rocketry. That happened very, very rapidly. Here is the Model Rocketeer, volume one, issue number one, February 1958. Eight page, uh, simply printed document. Um, there's a couple original copies of this in the, the Air and Space archives. That's Dell Hitch over here on the right side of this photo. Is this showing up at all? On the no. Screen? Okay. Dell Hitch over to the right was uh, NAR 3 or 4 and uh, was uh, kind of like Harry's right hand man during this era. <laughs> Let's take a look here. Here is the first article from the very first issue of Sport Rocketry's predecessor. And this is the do's and don'ts of model rocketry by Orville Carlisle, <coughs> Model Missile Association member number one. Let's read right down here. He says, don't use empty carbon dioxide castle cases as capsules to contain your propellant. Great, we'll make a note of that, Orval. We'll get right on that. <laughs> Let's go a little further. This is the very first safety code. It's on a, uh, a trifold brochure that was created around the same time. Let's look at this. I will never attempt to make my own rocket power plant without careful library research. <laughs> Gary, is that important? Careful library Absolutely. research? <laughs> so there's a, there's a method behind the madness here. Orville Carlisle 
in his first investigation into commercializing model rockets, found that the biggest problem was shipping, at least it was for him at that point. He thought his grand scheme was not to ship finished motors, but to ship parts, kits, and instructions to people teaching them how to make their own black powder <coughs> motors. Wow. And that was part of the National Association of Rocketry in this first year. I can't, haven't yet been able to pinpoint when the tide turned, and that became not a part of our culture, but it'd be an interesting data point to gather going forward. Let's move forward a little bit here. So he had a, uh, he's up in Denver at this point, and he's done what's effectively the first NAR R&D project as he prepares to uh, uh, put out his Archon kit. Steve, you have a, an Archon kit? <coughs> oh, actually, uh, yeah. The very first kit. Was this one, and I'll put it up here if you can see it later. And then subsequently, uh, he put out the, the, the next model was the Archon. Yeah, this was, this was product number one, the Arrow B High starter set, if you will. So Harry gathered his buddies and went and did an extensive flight test program on the Archon. He didn't want to ship a product that he didn't know about. And what he did was lay out a flight test program and then generate data from each of these flights and record it very carefully. And that's what this is right here. There's probably 60 to 80 pages there. You're welcome to come take a look at this afterwards if you like. I think it would be really cool if somebody took this raw data and did a formal R&D pro project and submitted it for NARA. That'd be kind of cool. <coughs> What's the nature of that data? Um, Those data. Altitude under different, they had different, they, they actually damaged some of the rockets, uh, different motors, different wind conditions, different launch le uh, rod links. They did some without any launch lug at all. So it's, it's fascinating stuff. <coughs> us in this room and probably nobody else in the world. Like short launcher <laughs> tests. The boosted Archon, two-stage, pure ballistic flight with no recovery. Here's a flight test report from that. Here, here's his, his summary from all of that. December 28th is the date on that. Non-spin, spinning, ejection altitude, uh, how it performs if, it, if it's launched out of power. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> Now we're up to 1964, this is this is really cool. So there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about changing the form of NARAM. You know, five days, seven days, whatever it is. It's the baton death march of rocketry, okay? <laughs> and, and here's NARAM 6 events and schedule. It's four days, guys. Four days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A lot. How many events? Probably like 30. <laughs> okay, first day is Hawk Boost Glider, Parachute Duration, Scale Turn In, Scale Altitude, Payload, Scale Judging Again, Scale Altitude Flights, Aerospace Systems, whatever that is, I'd have to assume with that. Uh, plastic Scale mo Model Conversion. So a lot of the same events and structure, just a shorter period of time in case anybody's interested. So the tennis would have to be low force something like that to get it all in, right? I just offer the information up to you to interpret it. So this is a letter from, uh, from Vern Estes to Harry Stein that I found pretty fascinating. This is dated uh, 1960. Eight. Um, he closed his copy of the letter to a New York State Assemblyman uh, and a separate sheet. Am I wrong in thinking this payout system of obtaining laws is for the birds? <laughs> let's look at this. Let's look at the letter he got from the State Assemblyman. You must appreciate that a revision in the law in this regard is bound to meet considerable resistance. 
In this connection, I've been con contacted by a former assemblyman who is, has indicated a willingness to undertake the efforts which are going to be necessary if this measure is to win passage. <laughs> and here's his quote. <laughs> this is Vern documenting this. I've got to think that Vern was thinking about, I need to be able to be able to tell a lawyer someday exactly what happened today. <laughs> he was told, for $10,000, I'll get the laws about model rocketry changed in New York State. Here's how much it's going to cost you. New York Public. A third now, a third when it gets out of both, both houses, a third when the governor signs it. Okay? Then down at the bottom, uh, oh, if I can't afford this, the guy asks, well, what can you pay? <laughs> okay, so here's a clipping from a, uh, a newspaper up in Connecticut. Harry has moved to Connecticut at this point. The National Association of Rocketry has pretty much consumed his life by the mid-60s. And it's, it's apparent from his correspondence that he's approaching burnout. He feels a need to put it in a form where it doesn't require his daily attention all day, every day. And he made a significant attempt to um, get aerospace firms to fund, to provide a, a pool of money that could be used to draw from, to pay for professional leadership for the NAR. Uh, he spent years on this, and he got exactly one donation for some token fund, some from some aerospace firm. It was nowhere near the $50,000 he thought was, was necessary to make this happen. Um, fundraising, then is probably as fundraising is now. Um, it's a miracle that we've got the money that we do to put on TARP. So Harry's dream of professional support for the NAR has finally come true 50 years later. So that's kind of intriguing there. Uh, here it says, NAR is growing too big for its volunteer launching pad before we can take many more members. We must have a paid national director and secretary with an office we're launching a campaign to raise $50,000. It never happened. And he resigned. Uh, I've got the letter here, end of 65, end of 66, and just stepped away. Here's a fascinating letter. There's a whole series of correspondence between Harry and Lee Keister of Centuri. Any Centuri fans in here? I was always an Estes guy. Growing up, you were either an Estes guy or a Centuri guy. <laughs> Steve was a Centuri guy. Grew up in Phoenix. Okay? There are people that do both sides, double A. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing you pick up as you go through all of this correspondence is that Harry desperately wanted to be involved with a model rocket company again after the model missiles, uh, model missile industries Model Missile Incorporated failure in 1959-1960. Um, Centuri actually engaged him about becoming more involved in the mid-60s. Um, and there was a serious correspondence between Harry and Lee Pister about moving the, the company to Connecticut, of all places. And here's why. Um, my interest in relocating east is threefold. He needs to be where the market is. What's the biggest state in the United States, population-wise? California. California. Could they sell model rockets in California then? No. no. Was the Mountain West a big region for them? No. It was Estes territory. They needed to go east. Um, our customer files show exactly where the, the market lies. Since California went out, 80% of the market is east of the Mississippi. This is Lee talking, not Harry here. Uh, long story short, it never happened. I think reading the correspondence, Harry was starting to try to insinuate himself into the, the operation of Centuri a little too completely. And Lee very much wanted to, to own and operate the company himself without outside interference. And uh, and just backed off the, the move at that point. Um, 
Harry started putting together lists of rockets the Centuri should make. Notice here that the scale list is a whole lot bigger than anything else on here. Harry was a scale rocket geek. That was, if it wasn't scale, he could probably care less about it. Um, there is some sport and contest stuff on here. And here's what hit me like a hammer when I saw it. He had an idea for a rocket called a center rock. <laughs> Let's look at the date. January 5th, 1966. So, let's all go out and uh, try to build a, a Centuri Center Rock and blow people's minds. How's that sound? Here's a NAR document I found that shows the size and location of the model rocket market as of 1971. Now, I'm not entirely convinced this is accurate, but it does <laughs> give you a good size of where they were probably getting members from. Uh, it's interesting to note the biggest bid they had was 129,000 potential members or market targets in California. Pennsylvania was huge for them back then. 116,000 targets there. Huh. Ohio was even bigger than Michigan by almost three times. Yeah. So, you can, so that was one of those. this is before the U.S. population really started to migrate southward. But it was just a fascinating thing to see. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm a sales and marketing geek, so it was kind of fascinating. Uh, something must have happened to enable them to sell into California more well, easily at this point. <laughs> something to consider. Yeah, Bill talked about it at an in Wisconsin about when the change in the law happened. Okay. Um, here is uh, another article. He, Harry continuously wrote articles for modeling magazines as well. And he talks about the size of the model rocket market at this point. This is uh, 1968. There are 150,000 people building and flying model rockets in the USA right now. Estes has a mailing list in excess of 125,000 active right. customers. That's a hell of a business right there. Centuri has a clean list of 95,000. AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics at that time, estimated 150,000 model rocket builders. So here was a demographic point for a brief time when there were more people building model rockets than there were building model airplanes in America. It probably lasted a long weekend, but there was a point. Okay? Uh, let's go on down here. Estes Industries is on three shifts every day, seven days a week. They're shipping 5,000 rocket motors every day. Centuri is on two ships and can't ship fast enough. They're 12 days behind on filling orders. Estes is building another 30,000 square foot building in addition to the 50,000 square foot building they already have. That's, that's, that's an impressively sized business for that time. Uh, who knows who Doug Malawicki is? Okay? Doug Malawicki was a Centuri employee back in the 60s. Um, in popular culture, he's probably best known for being the person who, the first person who helped Evil Knievel develop the Sky Cycle concept and built the first version of the Sky Cycle, the Sky Cycle X1, before Evil tried to kill himself in 1974. At the time, this is 1968, he's working for, uh, for Centuri, and he's sent a care package off to Harry, and uh, Harry has responded back to him. And he's thanking him for sending him that little Joe 2 kit, which is the greatest model rocket kit ever. Who's bought a little Joe 2 kit in the last couple of months here? Okay, It's the greatest model rocket and kit ever in the century. So everything old is new again. This is almost, this is 55 years later, uh, 50 years later, 49. So Harry is upset, though. He gave, uh, basically handed a finished product off to Centuri, a... Uh, uh, scale model, um, a, I think it's a Tomahawk D or something, it's, it's an IT something, let's call it that. It's an anyway, IQSY Tomahawk. Butch, butchered his design and lengthened and shortened things to make them fit into the package better and he's upset about it and they're not paying him as much as they're paying other guys who are doing similar work for them. Like, well, that's what I do. The idiot artist <laughs> even put my NAR number on the drawings as a scale marking. <laughs> okay, this is for my fellow NAR hamsters in the room. Any 
Narham's members here? Okay. This is a Zog 43 newsletter from October 1967. At this point, Harry had um, switched his focus to expanding model rocket internationally. G. Harry Stein announced that model rocketry is now the space modeling subcommittee of the FAI. That makes us the National Association of Space Modelers instead of the NAR, although we probably won't change the name. So. Longest continuously published newsletter in America. Is that correct, Jim? Good no? Okay. Well, I just declared it so. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk about going to Naram and building in your hotel room. <laughs> Here, here's Harry, where he's literally on the launch pad and he's spray painting it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story there somewhere. <laughs> That's the gal, um, the red band. Uh, Galilee Red right Band, kind of. Is it really? Oh, right, yes. Wow. Uh, Barbara Stein is in the background there on the left. Who's this? That's Barbara Stein. Okay. That's His wife? Howard Galilee. Yeah, that's Barbara. Here's a list of participants at NARAM 13. Uh, no historical importance here. Andy Jackson's listed up there as a B Divisioner. I thought really? that was kind of cool. I was uh, there. You were there? I was there. Uh, Ricky Peaster is listed in here as an A Divisioner. He's running Hobby Co. right now. He's probably the guy who, who green-lighted the, the reintroduction of Little Joe 2 last year. So that's kind of cool. I also noticed Mark McReynolds down here as a B Divisioner. Sure. There are probably other names that people in this room recognize that I don't. I Howard, I remember, sure. It's not complete because my name's not in there. Well, this, this is just the first page. State. This is Alabama, Arizona, California, and Colorado. Did you, did you see it as page one of eight? Yeah. There were four divisions back then, Jeff. And it was probably three days. Still by eight. There were 300 yeah. people there. <laughs> there was a big contest. 300 contestants. Let's take a look at this. This, this is going to make some people laugh. I wish George Gassaway were here. <laughs> That's no rule. Special contest rule interpretation. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> This is a uh, 1970 NARAM. This is Harry's uh, courtesy traffic warning from the Manned Spacecraft Center. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff in here. I should mention now that the bulk of what constitutes this archive is correspondence. Harry would make a carbon copy of every letter he sent, and he would just file it away for later use. And this, this is that later use, I guess. Bill Stein has told me that at one of their homes, I believe it was the Connecticut home, his room was above his father's office. And he would go to bed every night hearing the electric typewriter downstairs working. They had electric typewriters then? Yes, they did. Yeah. I thought it was electric. We got a warning for no Let's see what we've got here. National Association of Rocketry Honorary Members 1 through 20. Um, I put this on the, the NAR Facebook page a few months ago. Some of you may have seen this. Orville Carlisle is NAR 1, uh, Harry Stein is NAR 2, Del Hitch is NAR 3, Richard Keller, one of the guys involved with Model Missiles Incorporated, is NAR 4. The next two guys, Willard and Donald Kauf, NAR 5 and 6, are his father-in-law and his brother-in-law. They were critical in funding Model Missiles Incorporated. Uh, Albert Lewis, I, I confess I don't know who that is. Um, there's more names that I don't know. Down here we've got Bill Rowe from Colorado, NAR 13, Willie Lay, NAR 14, Warner Von Braun, NAR 16, uh, 16 uh, uh, Robert uh, uh, Barbara Stein, and Jacqueline Cochran, the aviatrix at NAR 20. Uh, 18 and 19 are skipped in this sequence. I think somebody in this room grabbed 18 because it was available at some point. Let's move on. What do we got next? Oh, this is a letter to one, 1967 letter to one of the uh, R&D judges following NARAM. I've been mulling over in my mind the research and development event that we held. I was greatly disappointed in the junior and leader divisions because, you know, eight-year-olds should do high-level research. <laughs> and complexity. Okay. Um, <laughs> wait for it. 
R and D is really <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the two preceding years, Gordon Mandel had won junior R and D. Okay, I don't. Well, tell us who that is. So that's uh, Gordon Mandel was. Uh, he went on to MIT, but okay. he was kind of prepared to graduate by the time he got here, and it just went on from there. <laughs> the R and D reports that he did were the most amazing. He just sent me copies of them uh, last year. Right. Absolutely stunning. Hundreds of pages of quality engineering work performed by a kid in high school. So that's what happened the two preceding years. And then Gordon went to MIT. Can't compete against Gordon Mandel. Okay, so we're approaching the end of my formal presentation here. And I just want to, this is probably the coolest thing I found in the entire bundle. I went through all 12 boxes, albeit very quickly. I need to go back again at greater leisure and with, with more detail. But this, this is the one that hit me like, I mean, just Eiffel Tower at midnight, okay? This is incredible. This is a February 1957 batch of photographs that I don't think has been opened in almost 60 years. They are photographs of Harry prepping his first Mark II, Carlisle Rocket Shoot Mark II. Uh, he probably asked his wife to come outside with him to snap the photos while he prepped it. You can see in his pocket uh, the parachute protector. Parachute protectors were not wadding back then. It was paper that was folded up in kind of a simple origami shape. It would be slid down the tube. The parachute would be inserted into that. Here's the simple launch pad over here. He's wrapped up the parachute. He's wrapping the shroud lines around it like you're not supposed to do, okay? And uh, he's probably in his late 20s at this point. And to just think about what's going through this guy's mind at this point is really inspiring. And, you know, we're all here today because of what's going through this guy's mind right here at this point. And I, that, that just really hit me. I, I made a special point of taking these, these photographs over to Brian Nicholas, the archivist I was working with there in space. I said, look, this is something special. This is something that Air and Space Museum needs to preserve appropriately, display appropriately, and make sure that it lasts forever, because this is really important to all of us right here. So I'll do much more research there. I don't know what's going to come of that research. I haven't decided yet. But uh, there's much more to be found there. And I haven't even been to Seattle yet, so we'll see what we can come up with there. Any questions at all? I, the, the hive mind here in the room can probably share a lot more than I can. Um, the uh, model missiles, the European Hive, uh, if I recall right, the, the box was less than 36 inches. And so the first launch rods were actually bent out of shape a little bit. And the first, as I mentioned earlier here, the first uh, round motors had an injection kit at the nozzle end, and that was filled with clay and then drill. Because I still have a couple. Okay. <coughs> Were you a customer at this point? What? Were you a customer at this point? Yes, I, I bought one of those kits in 1958. Okay. And then the Archon later, and I still have them you know, behind myself with the original motors. Um, the uh, parachute was, was a plastic, the uh, nose cone was pine wood. Later on, they went to a plastic type of nose cone with a tip of rubber. Bent of they, they make reference in some of the documents to, to oh, it. Uh, was, was, the, final. was the pine one first? Yes. Because in the B models, they had also, th this is a B kit. There was an okay. A kit. Right, okay. And the, the first motors they produced were the A4. And it was like approximately two, two years later, they came out with an improved B6. Which A4 was A4, A4, I think it was four second delay. The B4 motor was a four second delay. The, the correspondence between Harry and Orville makes reference to both of those motors, as well as the booster motors as well. So I'm going to ask Steve. Steve, you've got, Steve has an extraordinary collection of Stein ephemera, if you will. And, and, and tell us about some of the goodies you've got here in your box. First of all, I, yeah. when, when James says that, that Harry was a prolific writer, I mean, the guy wrote 60 plus books. The, the number of magazine articles that he did was in the hundreds. And so 
I happened through a weird set of circumstances to pick up uh, a first edition copy years ago. Well, the first edition copy that I ended up getting was actually this one <coughs> that was a signed first edition copy. And that kind of got me started on collecting Harry's books. You can get every book he wrote, you can get every magazine article he wrote. It's hard to get them signed. So <laughs> it wasn't any challenge to get the books. So since that time, I've been collecting. Then Bill uh, <coughs> ignited another passion, which was Bill sent me a copy of one of his nonfiction books in Japanese. His books are still being published today. So Bill sent this to me and went, Japanese? I didn't know that Harry had books in Japanese. So I started looking. That started another whole collection of trying to figure out all of his books that have been published in foreign languages. And they were in Greek. They were in Spanish. They're in Portuguese. They're, I mean, it, Italian, French. Uh, oddly enough, one of his least published foreign books is this one. Okay? Cool. The, the Handbook of Model Rocketry has been published in French, one edition in French, and one edition in uh, Italian. That's it. He produced a book in Germany. You know, his other book, the, uh, the uh, he had another book about model rocketry. The Arco book? What? Was it the Arco book? What, yeah, the Arco book. That was published in Germany also under the name Handbook of Model Rocketry in German. But so, Harry was just an amazing writer. One of the things I was able to pick up was this, and you can come down and see it. He gave a talk um, to the uh, American Rocket Society in 1958. Oh. They printed a copy of his remarks, and this showed up uh, in, from one of the booksellers, again, signed. And I, I don't think that there's another copy of this out there anywhere that I've ever seen. So, And eventually, all of this stuff is going to the museum. Uh, as I explained to people, believe it or not, to us in this room, we're all fascinated. These are not Van Goghs. Okay. <laughs> I usually pick them up for 10 bucks, 15 bucks. I mean, it, it's not a very expensive collection or thing to collect. But uh, it's been really, really fun trying to pick those up. Um, and that's about, that's about it. They have the motors down here and these if people want to see them afterwards. Uh, unlike the one in the Smithsonian and the one at the, at the, the Museum of Seattle, you're welcome to touch these. Okay? I believe you touch these things. It's connecting you're all welcome to go through these, look at all the pieces in there. They're really remarkable. Amazing stuff. Thank you, Steve. So we got a few minutes. Anybody got a cool G. Harry or early uh, Randy? Hey, Jim. Uh, this is great stuff. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Harry, Harry was a personal friend. I had dinner at Harry's house on more than one occasion when I moved to Phoenix, Arizona back in 77. Um, Harry and Barbie were like second parents to me. And I can't say enough about them as far as their being great people is concerned. Um, something that many people don't realize is that Harry wrote Star Trek novel number four. It's called The Abode of Life. And he once joked to me about the fact that he could live a good long time on the residuals from that particular book. <laughs> um, he also wrote a lot of fiction that people are not aware of under the pen name Lee Corey and also did a complete series of robot war books called Warbots which was some of his later later stuff and was just a lot of fun to read if you know I mean if you've seen things like uh, Terminator and seen the mechs that are in the Terminator movies that's essentially what Harry was talking about in his <coughs> books was mechs that were being run by service people who were behind the lines connected neurally to these robots fighting war so that human lives wouldn't be lost, that machines would be lost. And Great fun. Randy, he's up for an award this year. I, just, I ran across it. His book, Mana, is up for a Lifetime Achievement Award from National uh, Science Fiction Society. Yeah, it's very, very cool. I mean. That book was written, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah, long time ago. So, following on what you said about him being a prolific writer, um, there was a point, I, I'd have to go back and look at the, the <coughs> um, where he became
began supporting himself solely on his writings. Mm -hmm. And it was roughly 64, 65, somewhere in that, that, that time frame. Um, and I should mention, there, there, uh, there's a guy named Terry Dean who used to be very active on many of the rocketry forums, who did a lot of research uh, years ago into early model rocket history and put together a very comprehensive timeline that is, is very helpful to anybody who wants to research any of this. <coughs> yeah, so um, I spent a lot of time with Harry over the years. I went up to Connecticut and I flew with him in his section in the 60s. Uh, he was employed by a fluidics company up in Connecticut in the late 60s. Uh, it w was this Hike? No, H -Y -C -K? Uh, he was involved in some form of fluidics engineering. So he, he was using writing as a side life still at that point. Okay. And then he was uh, eventually then employed by MPC. We were going out a line of kits for, for MPC in 70, 71, 72. He, he rolled some of those out at the MIT convention center so running back then. There's a great deal of uh, correspondence on that very topic in the... Uh, so I think it was after he was, uh, after MPC was no longer in the rocket building business, that Henry <coughs> no longer was employed by anybody but solely supported by his own writings. I don't think he had a job working for the company after that. Okay. But I think it extended out for about 71, 72. He worked, uh, one thing I found that was fascinating, he worked for a, a basically a general engineering company, I'll call them. It would pick up any kind of engineering work they could called Hike, H-U-Y-C-K. And one project with them that he tried to get put into production by that company was a, uh, a simple sounding rocket to replace weather balloons. And there's uh, extensive documentation and drawings for this proposed rocket um, that never made it into production. And uh, it'd be neat for somebody to go back and more fully document that, that project. It'd be a great concept scale. Did I get it right, Jack? Okay, project for someone? If you can find it. Any other questions, comments? Any other reminiscences? Oh, I have a lot of those. <laughs> Uh, I attended on uh, four, five, six, um, uh, no, 18, I think, all of them, otherwise. And our board was limited to 75 contestants. We use an Air Force Academy grounds. Mm -hmm. The Air Force didn't know what to do with us, and they put us right outside the garbage dump. Uh, the electrical system failed every day except the last day. It was a five day event. And it wasn't until the last day that every event scheduled for the day was allowed, that actually finished. Uh, <coughs> Harry was believed the NRM would be the Olympics of model rocketry. So he was very severe in enforcing every day. For example, the event of the day could only be filmed that day, irregardless of weather. Right. We've gotten more liberal since. But uh, everything was <coughs> book. The, the pink book got its cover because Bill Rowe worked at the sugar company and had access to the company's printing equipment. And they happened to have, and this, this is what people don't know, they call it a pink book. The paper is actually called cherry. Okay. And so he printed it to have a little color to it. You know, uh, red at that time in, in our culture was a symbol for danger. So anything that was to attract your attention was done in rig. <coughs> Someone up here had a, a comment, Gary? Well, like Randy, I consider Harry a, a good friend. And, uh, you know, back in the eight, early 80s, he invited me on the NFPA committee, Pyrotechnics Committee. And I think in, in the early days, I was a little, I was kind of a rebellious rocketeer. And, he wrote me a letter, uh, kind of thing, rather than jumping on my case, as, as sometimes he was wont to do on other people, but he, uh, he wrote me a very encouraging letter that kind of helped direct me, you know, a little, a little better down the center path of things. And, and another way that he affected uh, the course of rocketry kind of later in life was, and uh, sure if you can probably, and I might be missing a few details here, but, um, when the reloadables came out, Harry wanted to come, he, instead of, you know, forming an opinion on it, he actually came out to our facility and Harry sat down and he assembled reloadable motors in our, in our facility and we 
fired them, and then he reloaded them. And I think it was after that time when he, it was it early in the 90s when he came and made that speech uh, to the NAR about you know moving in a in a little different direction. But you know he gave it, he gave it his attention and he formed an opinion based on you know, his observations and experience. So and that kind of paved the way for where we are now, but moving a little further down. Yep. It was a two-step process. There was first high-power rocketry where he and I ran a blue ribbon commission to evaluate this dangerous high-power rocketry stuff for the NAR in the mid-1980s, which led to him becoming an enthusiastic supporter of high-power rocketry because he convinced himself that it was safe. And the next step after that, uh, in the uh, early 1990s, was the reloadable stamp. So it was a two-step process for Harry to get first to high-power and then to, oh my god, metal casing motors. <laughs> but, uh, Harry had an open mind. You didn't convince him with words, you convinced him with data. And so both of those were highly data intensive engineering exercises that, that mostly I ran. And it took that level of data for him to change his mind. But when he was when he saw the data, he changed his mind. He was not stuck in the past. He was and nobody really thought that. I mean, everyone expected him to just dig in and hold on to the past. Yeah. But he, he had an open mind. When you were in those tests, you didn't expect the results that you got either, did you? Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to get. I, I wasn't sure particularly about metal casing reloadables, but uh, when I ran to the test, I convinced myself. Was it Harry that said that we were never supposed to be the National Association of Rockets under six tons? Actually, yeah, actually, actually, what, actually what he said was is that we were not the National Association of Model Rocketry. We were the National Association of Rocketry, right. and that really hit home. Yeah. That was the exact, I mean, hopefully that was the exact word that he used. Yeah, that was the that, term he used. That really hit home for me as far as, like, here's someone who's, like, everything is safety and do this, do that. That and, you know, fry ice at <laughs> 19. <laughs> Go fry ice. Yeah. Go. Yep. Well, he got that from his wife, who was from down east Maine. And that was a local term there. <laughs> I'd, ne I'd never heard that before. <laughs> the NER logo, that is not the original one. The original logo was the Eagle Val nozzle with the NER. Yes, others. There are examples of that throughout the world. Yes. Yeah. Well, guys, that's all I've got. I would encourage everybody go on the Quest Aerospace website, download the Orville, Carlisle, uh, Harry Stein, and correspondence. Read through it. Fascinating stuff. Thanks a lot.